This is part three of responding to Brian Holdsworth, a popular trad Catholic YouTuber, on why he's not Eastern Orthodox. In his first two parts, he missed the important parts like the filioque, like un the Rome switching to unleavened bread and having all these changing practices. And what do you know? In, in the <gasps> 1960s, you know, this church built on innovation, they revolt against their own tradition. They destroy their own ancient liturgy. Now they have modernist saints, they have a modernist ecumenical council, and they have a modernist liturgy. And he should know this, he's a trad Catholic. So, let's see if he has, has anything new to say. Well, if there's no one final authority like we have in the Pope, then you'd need an ecumenical council where all the bishops and patriarchs get together to define doctrines and settle controversies. But for the Eastern Orthodox as we know them today, there hasn't been an ecumenical council in over a thousand years. And what was it that happened a thousand years ago? I'm trying to remember. He's trying to say no Pope, no ecumenical council, not the true church. Even though the church in the first 300 years did not have an ecumenical council, the normative authority of the church is in the local synod. You don't have a greater epistemic certainty just because you have that office's office of the Pope. The Pope does not. Are you really telling me that the past 70 years has brought clarity and unity? No one can even say, if, is Vatican II pastoral, whatever that means, and then they can reject it? Do you have to accept Vatican II or not? Francis clearly says you do, yet the most traditional people in your church say you don't. Are the new canonizations infallible? No, they go the route of denying canonizations. Because even though canonizations are infallible, they are an act of papal infallibility, but if you accept that, then the Pope teaches there is salvation outside the church, which contradicts the prior teaching. And then the new mass, can anyone, the new mass, is a new mass even valid? Even though Francis says the liturgical reforms are irreversible. Oh, no, 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 but he didn't say that ex cathedra. We need the Pope for clarity, for unity. We need a final authority. But it doesn't really bring that. When he says, oh, the death penalty, no, no Catholic can ever support that, which contradicts the thousand years before of Catholic teaching. Uh, the, they change cremation. They change evolution. They have changed every single teaching. A, a Morris Laetitia. They, people say, this is heresy, this is error, this contradicts all the prior teachings. I mean, there are specific, specific examples like interfaith gatherings versus mortilio animos. So which one? Does the Pope bring the epistemic certainty that he is talking about? I don't think so. Can anyone say, oh, just follow the Pope? No, they can't say that. Even when it's, it's very clear and the Pope says, you have to follow this. The most traditional people in your church, the people who are consistent, deny it because they know if they accept it, which they have to do, it would contradict their whole system because Rome is a house of cards built on the Pope. And while Rome hasn't stopped calling and hosting ecumenical councils with representation from throughout the world, so there's something about the Eastern Orthodox churches to me that keeps them frozen and unable to reaffirm the universality of our faith without that one unifying voice that brings them all together. And that ability, I think, would have been incredibly useful for the East. You can't rely on ancient or early medieval councils to address something like Marxism, which has been devastating on the East. The Orthodox are the unchanging church. Rome likes innovation. They like doctrinal development. That's how you get stuff like Pachamama saying that Muslims worship the same God, interfaith gatherings, watering down literally every teaching, clown masses. Oh, because we can just continually innovate. No, we are stuck. We are petrified. We maintain the traditional teachings of the, of the church. And despite the oppression under Ottoman rulers, under communism, orthodoxy has prevailed. We have kept all of the ancient teachings. We have not wrecked our liturgy. We still make amazing saints. Can this be said for Catholics? Despite everything being fine, they didn't have any oppressors, yet their own ecumenical councils, Vatican II, Vatican I, are the things wrecking their church because it's a religion of worshiping the Pope of submitting to the Pope. And what is that Pope doing? He's destroying your ancient liturgy. He's destroying all your ancient teachings. He's canonizing modernists. So despite everything going right in the West, they can't even maintain their own teachings. And despite everything going wrong in the East, suffering under communism, under Ottomans, and being oppressed, we have the same teachings, we have the same liturgies, and we still make great saints. I think a lot of people thought I was criticizing the idea of ethnic or national churches, which is absolutely not the case. I think it's great that there are particular churches that express the theology, liturgy, and spirituality of a particular heritage.
In the previous video, you alluded to Eastern Orthodoxy, it's not the true church because they're just a bunch of ethnic enclaves versus us, the Roman Catholics, we're universal, we're inclusive. Again, you conflated inclusiveness with universality, what we mean when we say the church is Catholic, when it is universal in the creed, meaning the teaching is the same all across the churches, which is not true in the Catholic Church. It is true in the Eastern Orthodox. They are universal. And the other thing you basically alluded to was the reasons Constantinople fell and all uh, the Eastern Orthodox countries are struggling is because they aren't Roman Catholic. You alluded to that in your previous video. I was trying to make about the universality of the church is that there needs to be a way for those particular national or ethnic churches to express their communion and universality with each other. So in the Eastern Orthodox churches, as I understand them, they would say that their universality is expressed in their common theology, their orthodoxy. But the question for me has always been, how is that common theology defined? How do you make sure as new difficulties and controversies arise that the entire church responds to address them? How the church always had, through local synods, you don't need a ecumenical council. The normative teaching authority of the church is local synods. And we have the ecumenical councils, we have the church fathers. We have scriptures. It sounds like he's trying to make the argument that, oh, we need a pope. If you don't have a final authority, you can't function. But the Eastern Orthodox are functioning just fine without uh, the supreme super bishop monarch who, who can be judged by no one. And isn't it amazing that one of the most significant voices that contributed to the downfall of communism in the East was the Pope of Rome? As a simple convert to Christianity and then eventually Catholicism, it's never been easy for someone like me to evaluate the complex history and theology that frames these controversies. So when I was looking at the differences between Protestantism and Catholicism, I felt like I needed a simple and accessible way to resolve that debate in my mind. And it was provided in a few different areas, but especially in the Protestant idea that scripture is the only infallible authority on faith and morals. For that to be true, it would have to be taught in scripture, which it wasn't. So it was obviously self-refuting. So in the case of the East-West Schism, I've always similarly tried to find a simple and accessible argument that was self-refuting. And I felt like I found that in the Eastern position, which is what I was trying to communicate in last week's video. Now, you might say that it's a superficial argument, and maybe it is, but I don't think you can really ask for more of your average layperson when it comes to the things that they can grasp and make sense of. But you aren't just an average layperson. You're a Catholic with a wildly successful YouTube channel who has thousands of listeners. If you want a simple reason to be Orthodox over Catholic, how can you seriously blame the East, the Eastern Orthodox for the Great Schism, when it was the West who added to the Creed, the Filioque? Very simply, prior ecumenical councils forbid and anathematize any additions to the Creed. Yet, they added to the creed. Rome changed from leaven to unleavened bread. They, ha they have all these changing practices. They relied on forgeries, many of them, as justification for their supremacy. And we can see that which church was built on innovation? We can look at now. We can see at the modern Catholic Church, they have Vatican II, which very clearly contains there. They have modernist saints. They have a modernist neo-Protestant liturgy. Basically, if you want the unchanging faith of the church fathers, where are you going to get that? At a Novus Ordo parish, where it's a Zen, Buddha, dancing, liturgical dancing? Or at your average Orthodox liturgy, you're going to get a reverent divine liturgy. You're going to get Orthodox teaching. Let's just say the Roman Catholic Church is a true church, which means you have to accept Vatican II, you have to submit to the Pope, and the Pope says, don't convert the Orthodox. The Orthodox have valid sacraments, and that they can canonically receive in the Catholic Church, and that the Orthodox even made saints after the schism. Gregory Palamas, Seraphim of Sarov, your saint, your new saints have praised them. So we make saints, we have the sacraments, we have the Eucharist, we have Christ. Your Pope says not to convert the Orthodox. So why exactly do I need to be Catholic? Even if Catholicism was true, it isn't. But then it's not that big of a deal to be Orthodox. A concept like the filioque is so far removed from the lives of your average Christian that it's just not the kind of thing that you're going to get that we're going to get hung up on. So trying to sort through that theology isn't where I focus my attention. It is hard to understand, but you can read the prior councils, which specifically forbid and anathematize any additions to the creed. 
It can't be any more clear. Don't add to the creed, especially without an ecumenical council. Yet the Pope just did it. He just added to the creed one of the most essential things. And it makes no sense because in the Catholic Church, you can go to an Eastern Catholic Church and they say, don't recite the filioque. They don't recite the filioque. They want it removed. They could have agreed with me. We eventually need the filioque taken out of the Roman creed. And then the Roman Catholics, the Latins, will say, no, we need the filioque. So which one is it? It isn't a unified church. It isn't universal. You can't even agree on a creed. The Orthodox all agree on the creed. So it's very simple that the Rome had no authority to add to the creed because of prior ecumenical councils. And to understand the theology, it is very complex, but an easy way to understand it is that the Father causes the Son and the Spirit. Okay, there we go. That's the monarchy of the Father. But then the Catholics come in and say that, oh, the Father causes the Son and the Spirit, but then the Son also causes the Spirit. So again, this is an imbalance in the Trinity because then the Holy Spirit causes no person. This is a totally imbalance in the Trinity. It is a denial of the monarchy of the Father, which was basically taught as dogma at the Second Ecumenical Council with the Cappadocian Fathers. This isn't supposed to be an apologetic for why Catholicism is true and Eastern Orthodoxy is wrong. It's my own perspective and my own reasons for why I'm Catholic and not Eastern Orthodox which is going to be inherently one-sided. And I think that's okay. It's an opportunity to hear one perspective among many. If you're Eastern Orthodox and you heard something like last week's video, you probably would go and find some Eastern Orthodox commentaries on the same thing, just as I did when the shoe was on the other foot. And that is why I've responded to his videos, to respond to these critiques. And I know it is just his personal opinions, but still, when you make a video, it kind of presupposes that we should be Catholic. I know it's his personal opinion. And like I said, I like him. I'm glad that he says that, you know, this is one-sided, but that's why I come in and I'm telling you the Orthodox perspective on what he is saying. And I think that's totally fine. It's a way of engaging in dialogue without feeling threatened in the process. Ultimately, I would hate for people to think that I was trying to position myself in an adversarial way against Eastern Orthodoxy. The honest fact is I find a lot of the peculiarities of Eastern Christianity to be really attractive and really beautiful. I love the simplicity of it. I really like icons. I absolutely love Eastern architecture. And I love how you've been steadfast against the aberrant currents of modernism. And I could go on. Brian, I like that you like Eastern Orthodoxy. I think if you seriously looked into what we are claiming, if you watch my videos on why I left Catholicism for Orthodoxy, you would agree with me. Because there's no way to make the Catholic system work without being a set of a contest. And again, set of a contest is a delusion and it vindicates Eastern Orthodoxy. There, there's no way to make the Catholic system work. And so I'm saying that if you really do read into the Orthodox arguments, you will say, you will come out with saying the Orthodox are right on the filioque. It doesn't belong in there. They are right on papal supremacy. We both believe in papal primacy. They are right in leavened bread, not unleavened bread, receiving under both kinds, having giving infants communion, having married priests on uncreated grace on the essence energies distinction. If you hear the Orthodox out, you will become Eastern Orthodox. Overall, leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Let me know if you want me to do more videos on traditional Catholicism. And if you have any other questions, thank you. God bless.